I'm your second presenter of the morning. Uh, my name is uh, Rick Kels I'm with the University of Nebraska. And I'm going to be sharing a, a study, uh, an undergraduate research project that uh, uh, was done here, or is in the process of being wrapped up by Megan Hamoka. <coughs> and uh, we'll share a little bit of some of our early findings here today. Uh, within the, the feedlot industry, or the, or the open lot production systems that we have that you'll see a lot in the Midwest uh, for both beef cattle and some with dairy, we, we have some really unique challenges in trying to predict nutrients that we're going to recover uh, from this facility, the, the concentration of those nutrients for nutrient planning. And so uh, the, the opportunity that we had was to look at a rather large data set uh, that provide us some insights as to what this looks like, but had never been tapped for this particular purpose. And so we're going to be sharing our, some of our efforts to pull that data set together and uh, and try to draw some conclusions. Uh, in our, our open lot systems, we're, you know, historically the, the planning that we do is just based upon animal numbers. And we use this in, in all of our industries in terms of predicting land requirements, <coughs> predicting uh, manure production, and so forth. I, and, and animal numbers is certainly a part of that. But in a system like that, uh, feed has an important component to this. It's going to affect the nutrients that we deal with. But weather is also going to affect that because it's going to define that surface that we're dealing with in that feedlot and our ability to recover nutrients uh, from our different feeding periods. And there, there are other factors, management factors, the choice of whether we even want to harvest all that manure or we're going to use some of that manure for building mounds for drainage and purposes such as that. So uh, some real challenges that are unique to an open lot system that, are, that you do not have in a, in a housed system. Uh, we had a, the opportunity to look at a, a large data set for a, a research uh, feedlot that we operate in eastern Nebraska. Uh, there was over a 15 year period we had 400 plus unique feeding trials and we've established uh, on this facility a standardized procedure for collecting uh, manure quantity and concentration as well as the runoff quantity and concentration and allocating nitrogen and phosphorus between its all its endpoints uh, for, for each of these trials. And we used this for over the whole period. Now these trials were being used primarily for feeding purposes. They were used in some places to manage, I look at disposition of, of nutrients, but we said we could put all of this data together and see if we could come up with a clearer picture of the, the characteristics and the quantities of manure that we're dealing with and specifically their nutrients. Uh, the student uh, that I had, uh, pulled all of those various data sets together, uh, aligned them. Uh, then we began to look at a, a doing some uh, initial analysis for seasonal changes, diet and feed intake, management practices, things such as that. Uh, those that looked more interesting, we began to, uh, we, well, we put it all into Excel, did our correlations there, and then those that looked most interesting, we ran through some SAS regression. And we'll share some of uh, the results that are beginning to come out of that here. Uh, I, I won't bother you with a, a lot of numbers or a lot of just averages that came out of that. Well, one of the first things that was obvious to us is that historically we've used standards such as ASABE that give you a single value for all cattle that we harvest from a, an open lot system. And we feed cattle in Nebraska and most regions of the country. Uh, we'll bring them in for a summer feeding period or a winter feeding period pre predominantly. And the manure characteristics and the quantities of nutrients that we're harvesting are dramatically different during those two periods. And so equating the two with a single standard value was one of the first things we recognized did not make much sense. And I'll just point you to a couple of the values. Here's the nitrogen harvested on a grams per head per day. And the phosphorus, you can see that. You can see significant differences, uh, summer versus winter feeding periods. Uh, and only one out of those four values actually correlate uh, relatively closely to the ASABE standard. The other thing you will notice is the coefficient of variation that is also pointed here. You know, it'd be a single standard deviation on a expressed on a percentage of the mean, and those are large. And so the second thing we began to realize is that the characteristics of this product we're dealing with in our open lots is changing very dramatically this year to next year, 
this spring to this fall uh, situations such as that. And so how are we ever going to get to a point of being able to use standardized values in predicting for our permitting processes to some of the tasks that we have to go through? Okay, so our, our take home message is first from this slide I would say there's a very significant difference between the winter and the summer feeding period. We're not collecting the same product in terms of moisture, in terms of organic matter, in terms of, uh, of the nutrient content. And the second is that uh, uh, the, the standard values we've historically used, just uh, a, a single value to represent multiple situations just is not a, a good approach at all. The, the second thing the, the student has done for me is taken a look at uh, what is the distribution of the nitrogen and phosphorus from all of these trials on average? And I'll just share that here. We'll do it on a summer versus a winter feeding period. Sorry, that graphic doesn't look very bright to you, but uh, in terms of what was retained by the animal, uh, in both cases, winter and summer, the animals retained 13% of the phosphorus and the nitrogen that went in. The other 87% goes out the back end. I always uh, try to remind people, we, animals don't produce phosphorus. They simply partition phosphorus between what the, the, the products that we are sending off to market and the product that we send to our fields. So they're not producing, they're, they're simply partitioning. Now of that which is sent to the field or what the animal excretes, you can see there's a significant difference winter versus summer for the nitrogen that's in the manure that we actually harvest, so several months later after it's been excreted, and the nitrogen that we're losing in the environment. And I'll come back to this message. Uh, notice in our open lot systems, quantity or the percentage of the nitrogen that we're losing. And that number can be a little bit on the scary side. We'll come back to that. Uh, these differences likely weather, temperature related conditions in terms of nitrogen loss. Now, if I want to look at this from a phosphorus perspective, we can do the same things. I thought, yeah, these are going to come out looking pretty closely the same. Phosphorus we conserve. Uh, well, I, as I am often in my career, I'm wrong in my, my <laughs> first guess. So I've learned to accept that as just the way life goes. <laughs> so here is the summer feeding period. Uh, we retained 19, about 20 percent for both of the uh, winter and the summer feeding periods, you'll see. Uh, only about 1 percent shows up in the runoff for the phosphorus. The manure is represented here, uh, representing 47 percent uh, of that phosphorus. And then we simply don't account for 32 percent. So when we harvest manure after our summer feeding period, Apparently, 32% remained in the lot. We did not harvest it on average, okay? And even when we follow very standardized procedures for trying to collect that manure from these. Now, here's the winter feeding period. Nin manure actually represents 95% of what we fed. We still, we, won't, we still retain roughly that 20% here. So we've actually harvested more phosphorus in following that winter feeding period, and probably that's some of this phosphorus that we didn't account for over here. Now why is that? Why aren't we just harvesting it all? Well, we have an earthen surface. That surface is impacted by rainfall, by weather conditions. Sometimes of the year it's more like soup, which it has been in the spring. Sometimes of the year it is as dry as a desert. And so our ability to get in there and define with our equipment that interface between the manure and the soil surface is a, a challenging operation for anybody that has ever done that. And so the lot surface conditions probably have a lot to do with our ability to define that surface and, and identify where, where, where is that interface that we should be working with. Okay. You'll also notice that the quantity of nitrogen or phosphorus that's harvested on a per head per day basis is substantially different in that winter and the summer period. So using a standard value again for uh, estimating 
our, our land application plans, uh, uh, it, it presents some challenges. Okay. All right. Now I'd like to look more at some of the variability of this data set. And here we have uh, plotted what the animals take in in terms of the feeding feed intake versus what we are harvesting. And then we've separated the data by the winter and the summer feeding periods. You can see there's two distinct data sets, two diff the, the areas are two different. And you'll notice that uh, we are harvesting anywhere for any one of these trials, anywhere between about two and three uh, kilograms per finished animal. It's on a kilograms per finished animal basis, up to 30. So a factor of 10 for an individual trial, an individual period of harvesting manure from this feedlot uh, from the low end to the high end. And so that variability is just tremendous. And we've got to be thinking in terms of how we're going to plan our future when we have that kind of variability. Uh, we asked could we use the feed intake to predict manure. Uh, some of you may be aware in my earlier part of my career back when we were trying to rewrite the ASABE <coughs> standards, we drew those correlations between feed intake and, and excreted manure. We thought that was pretty important. We worked with the animal science community to create those standards. I doubt if very many of us use those standards because they're complex. But in the end, in this situation, the predictability of feed intake uh, did not, does not define a lot of that variability that we're seeing there. So um, maybe it wasn't all that important to go through all that work. Uh, so feed intake, intake only partially explained the harvested manure. The, there's a lot of variabilities, so other factors are involved. Uh, we also looked at diet crude protein. At one time we thought just knowing the crude protein or the percent phosphorus going in the diet, we might be able to predict uh, manure uh, production uh, or in terms of nutrient production, and that proved to not be a, a good predictor at all. Okay. Uh, here's the same kind of data, but for phosphorus, the previous one was for nitrogen, the phosphorus intake of the animals, the harvested manure, uh, a little bit better explanations based upon the P intake uh, of what we're excreting, but still a lot of variability. Take home message is pretty much the same. Uh, certainly, we're continuing to see the value of separating winter and summer feeding periods and, and nutrient intake provides us some predictor, especially phosphorus, not so much in the nitrogen area. Uh, we also had the ability to define uh, losses in this model or in this, uh, uh, how we manage the data from this system. And it, it was done by a, a balance. So the losses uh, of nitrogen was anything that just we couldn't account for in terms of the manure, the runoff, and in terms of the animals that we shipped. Uh, and so that probably is mostly ammonia losses, but there may be other forms of loss. And you begin to see, again, a lot of, uh, a lot of variation in the data, uh, s uh, some predictability of uh, seasonal that uh, is important to consider. We tried to put it on a feed intake basis, and it did some, provided some explanation of that variability, but a uh, lot, lot of variability that we don't know how to do. Uh, but uh, this value, I, I think the number I want to point out is maybe this 90 grams per head per day here. You start putting a number on it that ends up to be, uh, I think it was 36 or 35 kilograms per finished head space in our beef feedlots, um, 80 pounds, I, I deal in English, so 80 pounds per finished space, 10,000 head lot, which we have a lot of in Nebraska, 800,000 pounds of nitrogen, $300,000 of lost income potential, uh, a lot of ammonia in the air, and some people are starting to pay attention to ammonia in the air. So. Is this an issue that we have to spend some more time on? And I only raised the question today, and I'll let smarter people answer that ahead of me, after me. Some take-home messages. Again, winter, summer was important. Intake shows promise for predicting end losses. Uh, and how big of an issue is this? I'll leave that as a question for you. <laughs>
Uh, I think because of time, I'm going to skip by some of the efforts we did to predict the, what was tied to the losses and get to these conclusions. Uh, a lot of variability, uh, very unique uh, from what we see in terms of a, a roofed structure. And, and we just have to accept that uh, in these open lot systems. Uh, some of the challenges that open lot systems present us from the manure system are part of the drivers we're seeing to some trend towards roofed housing for, for beef production. And maybe that will be continued because of that. Uh, one of the challenges though that I think this is most difficult or presents the greatest difficulty is in some of our permitting of these facilities and the expectations of the permitting process. We certainly don't have standard values that can predict the future in terms of how much land I'm going to need from this facility, how much manure should I be putting on for a, a tons per acre basis. And we're asked to put together, at the time that we uh, put together our, our permit, we, we have to put a plan out there for the next five years. And the predictions we're making with these plans for the next five years are ludicrous in terms of having any real value. But uh, we still go through that process. So we have to recognize those numbers in terms of tons per acre that we predict when we're doing the planning uh, and what it's actually going to be the year that we apply that manure is going to be, sub could be substantially different. So I think that gets to that, uh, that advanced planning issue that I'm raising as being <laughs> kind of a, an exercise in futility. And I wonder about these losses that we're experiencing. Is this a question that we need to return to? There was a recent paper that came out uh, in, in one of the, I think it was the Nature Journal, talked about uh, the nitrogen that we're applying to corn production, the ammonia losses to that, leading to several thousand people dying a year in addition to, uh, to what happens currently. Uh, they're doing their risk analysis. Is anybody going to take notice of our, our open lot systems and begin asking about the nitrogen that we're releasing here? I don't know. But there are some people paying attention to ammonia losses from agricultural systems. So I think with that, I'll thank my two co-authors, uh, Megan in particular, who's the undergraduate that's uh, headed out here in a couple weeks and uh, on to better things. Questions? We have a couple minutes. You have two. Yeah. I have a question. Um, yes, Randrock. I'm not a, as familiar with these type of manure management systems and feedlots mm -hmm. as, as you. But uh, the ones I visited have some downslope uh, <coughs> rain catchment system. Did you look at that? Uh, did some of the nutrients transfer down there? And uh, I probably didn't point that out. In those uh, circular graphs, there was a runoff factor. For nitrogen, it was 3%. For phosphorus, it was 1%. So that's what ends up in that the runoff that goes into the holding ponds that we manage, yes. Okay. So, but it was a very small part. <clears throat> Historically, we would have guessed under 5%, so that seems to match up with kind of our historical guesses in that area. What do you mean? Yes, please. What did you mean about the, um, the ammonia losses and people dying during the corn? Well, I, 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 this is not my area of expertise, but uh, ammonia losses can lead to higher uh, PM, was it? 2.5. Yeah, the, the, the fine particles yeah. and that leading to health issues. Uh, so I'm not going to go any further than that because I'll get myself in trouble. <laughs> it's all opinion. I had a question in the back there. So, so have you tried looking at antecedent uh, nitrogen losses or nitrogen removal? It seems like you have a lot of the materials coming off in the next season, specifically like uh, in summer to, to winter or mm -hmm. vice versa. Have you tried looking at that data set based upon antecedent uh, removals or emissions or losses or anything like that? And I'm, I'm not certain I'm following you, Dan, but uh, we, we only had the tra ability to attract, to uh, measure nitrogen going into a pen of cattle and exiting as animals, as manure, as runoff, and then anything else that we could not account for in terms of nitrogen, we assumed it occurred sometime during that feeding period. 
Well, the, the phosphorus is kind of what I'm speaking mostly okay. to because that's the simpler one to work with. You know, it's, it's either it's running off or it's staying there in the manure. You might be able to use like a time step <coughs> or a function. For correcting yeah. sense. And, and that might also apply to nitrogen to some degree. Yeah. I'm going to visit with you about that a little bit. Yeah. Got to wrap I think up. we need to wrap up here. So I'll be glad to visit with folks later on other questions.